At Aspire, we empower and connect our community with tools and resources for advocacy, education, support, and awareness. We know that PANS PANDAS is a devastating disorder, but recovery really is possible. And we know that early diagnosis and treatment can lead to improved outcomes. So at Aspire, we aim to improve lives of those affected by PANS and PANDAS by helping to close the gap between the onset of symptoms and the start of treatment and support. Um, we have programs that reach five core audiences to increase awareness and understanding uh, on a national level while providing critical support to all members of our community. We are fortunate to be able to be supported by our professional advisory board and all of our volunteers. So we are able to present the programs that um, we do today. On the, for the national general public, um, we have awareness campaigns and educational outreach. For families and patients, we have one-on-one -on -one support, educational programs, and for our parents and um, adult patients, we have a Facebook group that you can join and along with a few new programs launching soon. For schools and educators, we have a lot of toolkits and handouts for schools, but we also provide in-services to educators and nurses for free, thanks to our donors. Plus, we have lots of information for parents on the website, and we recently added a few new sections. Um, for legislators, we have information on how to get started in the legislative process. If you're in a state that doesn't um, have anything happening already, and a team, I highly suggest that you look at some of our resources. We also create state pages for the boots on the ground state leads so that they can put all their information about call to actions about different legislative matters. And then we spend a lot of time talking to legislators on the phone and writing letters in support for different bills. And for as far as our providers and clinicians programs, we recognize that our providers have a tremendous amount on their plates as they care for our loved ones. So we have started a program in which we provide doctors um, and therapists with literature on PANS PANDAS that they can hand out to their families. Our webinar series, we've divided it into five categories so we can support many different audiences within our PANS PANDAS community. So we have the five categories are treatment and scientific updates, behavioral health, integrative medicine, school support, and family and patient support. Dr. O'Hara, who I am very glad to call a friend and personally, she sees my sons and we've been very blessed by the care that she's given us for many years. Um, but I know that she's been an incredible teacher for many doctors to come. So today she's going to be talking on Pans Pandas. And the name of her lecture is Demystifying Pans Pandas, a, a Functional Medicine Guide on the Basal Ganglia Encephalitis. So of course, she's going to talk about Pans Pandas and how they're a complex autoimmune disease, diseases that require multi-system approach. And she definitely understands how to do that. Um, and she will present some case studies um, and the latest research in the assessment and treatment of these devastating but recoverable illnesses. Dr. O'Hara is a board certified pediatrician. Before she embarked on her medical career, she taught children with autism. Luckily for us, she decided to change fields and become a doctor. Um, she was a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She got her <laughs> master's in public health at University of Pittsburgh, where she also did her residency, chief residency and general pediatric fellowship. In 1993, she entered private practice and then in 1998 became her consultative, consultative integrative practice solely for children with special needs. And in 1999, she dedicated her functional medicine practice to the integrative and holistic care of children with chronic illness, neurodevelopment disorders such as ADHD, PANS and PANS, OCD, Lyme, and ASD. Um, but her early days of teaching have led her to training clinicians both in the United States and abroad. And I'm really thrilled to say that she's an written a much, much needed comprehensive guidebook called Demystifying Pans and Pandas, a Functional Medicine Desktop Reference on Basal Ganglia Encephalitis, um, which will be available soon this summer. Um, I know it's gonna be 
an incredibly useful and comprehensive tool for so many providers and it will really, really help grow our list of qualified PANS and PANDAS providers, which we all know in this room that we sorely need. So without further ado, I will stop talking and give her the floor. Thank you so much for coming and doing this for everybody. Thanks everybody for joining, Gabriella. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It had to stop sometime, so I had time to lecture, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I did wanna say very briefly that the, the guidebook will be coming out this summer. Um, if you are a practitioner of any sort yourself, a therapist, a teacher, a nurse, a chiropractor, a naturopath, a doctor, whatever, um, please uh, reach out to Shannon. The email is here to get the, the field guide, which is an introduction and sort of gets you on the, the mailing list for getting more information this summer. We will, in addition to the guidebook, be having a membership and mentorship program because the most important thing to me is teaching other practitioners how to get this going. Right now, we are booking our new patients in January of 2023, and that's just not acceptable. So we're working very hard to bring that down, but in the meantime, I would love to teach more practitioners how to make this uh, a treatable um, disorder. So let's get started. Um, my mentor was Dr. Sidney Baker, who is the grandfather of functional medicine, and he always shared this, these, this quote in his talks, follow those who seek the truth, but flee from those who have found it. And, you know, when somebody says, I don't believe in pans or pandas, or that doesn't exist, I run the other way. Um, I, but what we're trying to do is have more and more people looking for the truth for our kids and what that really means, because this is an autoimmune disease. So it's affected by the genomics. Why is it only one in 200 children, um, not like one in two, like in our practice or one in one? It's, uh, you know, with any autoimmune disease, it's environmental factors. If it's pandas, it's strep. If it's pans, it could be other infections or metabolic factors. And then as we all know, the gut and the microbiome affects all of our clinical outcomes of disease and all of the problems that, that our children go through and the interaction between our ecosystems of our guts and our brains are very important to all autoimmune disease. So let's look at this one in specific. Um, as I said, it's about one in 200 children. Um, it's a subgroup of those children with OCD, about 25 to 30% of children with OCD, it's of acute onset. So that abrupt onset are the kids we're talking about. PITANS was, a, was a, an acronym we used, certainly PANDAS, as, as Sue started in the 1990s, and then PANS came out of the 2012 white paper. Um, and now we, you know, Russell Dale calls it post-streptococcal autoimmune encephalitis of the basal ganglia, and we may just call it basal ganglia encephalitis. Um, but the bottom line is um, uh, the prototype was Sydenham's Korea, with rheumatic fever. And those children, whether it be with recurrence or presentation, in addition to their choreic movements, also had emotional ability and, and OCD. So this is from the white paper that, that Sue and 29 other practitioners uh, put together. And we see that Sydenham's Korea is the prototype. And then we have pandas, which is strep associated, other microbes, going to leave Lyme separate. It's its own real complex disorder, but mycoplasma, viruses, environmental factors like pesticides, anesthesia, the infectious and non-infectious infectious triggers come together to give us the diagnosis or the acronym of pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. And I cannot say that enough, it is of abrupt and dramatic onset of OCD and in a 20% of a restrictive eating disorder. And then two of the following, you know, an 11 year old that all of a sudden can't separate from mom and go to school or go to bed, a nine year old that has emotional ability, full depression or that zero to 60 to anger, rage or aggression, the, the developmental regression, behavioral regressions, the sensory and motor abnormalities, certainly the tics we see in a large majority of children, 
And then sine qua non is the handwriting deterioration. You have an abrupt onset of OCD and the handwriting goes to pot. That's, that's pretty much uh, determinant of this disease. Deterioration of school performance that it's of abrupt onset. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the somatic symptoms, the urinary symptoms, the sleep disturbances, the REM disinhibition, that, that very restless sleeper. And of course, not identified or defined by any other disorder. So I love looking at things in pictures and in graphs. Um, there's a large family history of autoimmune disorders with this disease. 80% um, of kids have sleep problems. 98% have behavioral regression where they have baby talk or tantrums. 90% have handwriting deterioration. 90% have urinary symptoms, that frequency, urgency, and uresis, that deer in the headlights look. And these are the kids with auditory and, and visual hallucinations that end up in our psych hospitals. And, um, you know, uh, this is a very difficult disease, but one that is manageable and treatable. Um, the margin drift is something you might see. They start to neglect the left-hand side of the paper if they're right-handed, uh, shorten attention spans, loss of math, visuospatial skills, particularly geometry and, and drawing pictures, copying pictures, the dysgraphia, which is the handwriting deterioration, and also clumsiness in gym. Um, with a good neuropsychologist, the executive function deficits that are seen with PANS and PANDAS are different than, those, the, the, than of those of kids with Tourette's or other tick disorders. There can also be EEG abnormalities in some, and up to 85% will have that restless sleep, that nonspecific REM disinhibition, where when they go into deep sleep, they're constantly moving. They end up at the other end of the bed or the sheets are all over the place. And this is the handwriting deterioration in one little girl that I know that went from this on one day to this the next. So from this to this. So what's the differential diagnosis? We certainly have to rule out acute rheumatic fever in Sydney's Korea. We have to rule out other vasculitides, NMDA receptor um, antagonists. Any forms of abuse or neglect, um, sexual, physical abuse, any overdoses of drugs or medications, any exposure to toxins, um, any tumors or strokes, these are other things that will cause abrupt onset of these symptoms. But Tourette's and OCD are not acute. Tourette's has to be of six months duration to get that label. And OCD is usually a much more subacute or chronic presentation. And more than 80% of these cases have evidence of inflammation. The inflammation of these purple areas, you, you can see with Sydenham's Korea and pandas, there, there's a lot of inflammation. But with kids with OCD or Tourette's, or, or those neurotypical children, there is not the inflammation that we see. So what happens? A child in pandas, a child gets exposed to group A step, strep. There's a genetic susceptibility, some HLA-B alleles we'll talk about. And then there's a misdirected immune response. Rather than just attacking the strep germ in the throat or, or anal strep or in the sinuses, those strep antibodies recognize the host and there's molecular mimicry where the antibodies then attack the basal ganglia in pandas. And there's inflammation of that area of the brain. With rheumatic fever, it can also be carditis, polyarthritis, erythema marginatum, and certainly the Sydenham's chorea when it affects the, the brain. How do we know this exists? Well, there's a lot of autoimmunity in first degree relatives. There's a strong association with certain HLA-B alleles as we see with us other vasculitides. There's a high rate of autoimmune signs like a positive ANA. There's other autoantibody tests, which we'll talk about, and a plethora of animal models showing basal ganglia inflammation or autoantibodies or strep-specific TH17 cells or imaging data like this showing inflammation and activated microglia. But for me as a clinician, 
it's about our N of one. It's about the child that's in front of us as parents or as clinicians and how they respond to our therapy. That is the proof that, that this disease um, exists and is treatable. This is the CAM kinase testing. In Sydenham's Korea, the numbers in the calcium modulated kinase activation are very high. With pandas, they are also very high. Whereas with kids with OCD, ticks, ADHD, they may be much lower. Now there is a gray area in this 100 to 130, 140, where you may have some children with ticks or, or some neurotypical children with levels in that area. But you get above 150, that again is pathognomonic for pandas. This is a very expensive test and I use it in atypical presentations in kids I'm not sure, in kids that aren't responding, but not as a piece of diagnosis. The diagnosis is clinical. So how do we prove it? Well, it's history and physical exam. Again, most moms that I talk to whose children actually have this disease will say they were fine on February 12th and on February 15th, they were a different child. When they are in a flare, when they are inflamed, they may well have choreoform movements. And that's when they're standing straight, feet together, arms outstretched in front of them, fingers outstretched, and shut their eyes. And they cannot stand still with their fingers outstretched, but instead start playing the piano with their fingers or supinating their hands. That's choreoform movements. And on physical exam, we may see evidence of infection. We may see evidence of inflammation, and we'll talk about that. We want to look and culture possible infectious sites, certainly the throat. Many children with pandas will not um, complain of a sore throat. They will have behavioral changes, but if you culture the throat, it will be positive. Viral cultures, um, COVID uh, is a... a um, precursor of PANS. We have seen much more PANS in the last few months secondary to COVID. The laboratory evidence, we always look at inflammatory markers, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, uh, SED rate, and ANA. Um, in our practice and in some studies, greater than 56% um, of the children will have a positive ANA. That is the most frequently positive measure. We also look for infectious markers, the strep titers, ASO and anti-DNAs B, the mycoplasma titers, IgG and IgM, but they may not be positive right away. They may not be positive for six weeks or more. Or if a child also has immunodeficiency, which we see in about 30% of the kids, may, they may never mount an antibody response. So we do not treat titers. It's only a guide if we have the clinical history. A high strep titer does not mean that a child has pandas. It means that they previously had a strep infection, but only the abrupt onset of symptoms and the association with strep are indicative of pandas. Mycoplasma may well be positive in some of these kids. We have a lot in our area. Um, and sometimes viral titers, but those are often much less helpful because there are as many viruses as there are of us. Well, there's thousands more than there are of us on this call. The CAM kinase, I said again, when it's not a classic clinical picture, and it may be more helpful when a child is in a flare. Now, Emerson didn't mean the gut when he said what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us but that certainly is um, what I mean. The gut is always a place we have to start to heal these children. It doesn't mean that if they have strep on a stool test, they have pandas. No, many of our children have strep in their guts, but it means that a healthy gut is very important to healing our children. So what are the sites? The, the throat is the most common. A rapid test may have high, high false negative rates. So please get a culture. The tonsils and adenoids, you know, what's very interesting there is when children have tonsillectomy, um, there's often a discordance between what's on the surface and what's in the core. So if your child is having a tonsil or adenoidectomy, ask for a culture of the inside of the tonsils and the adenoids, because there are very different concentrations of germs 
and also of cytokines and other inflammatory markers in our children with PANDAS. They can be strep in the urinary tract, it can be in the gut, and, and a perianal culture, especially in those kids with a red anal ring is very important. Sinuses, especially if a child has frequent upper respiratory infections or recalcitrant sinus infections. And these are some of the clues, you know, um, the choreoform movements, as I mentioned, those piano playing fingers, um, the red anal ring, just a small ring around the anus. And we see that in up to 20% of our kids. It's documented in the literature in about 7%, but we definitely look for it. The peeling fingers, about six weeks after a child has a strep infection, about 10% of them, their fingers or toes will peel like glue. That may be a sign that what they're going through was due to, to strep. And then the tongue. Now, this is a, a yeasty tongue. There's some whiteness to this tongue. But the raised papillae, the raised little strawberry tongue markings are what are indicative of pandas. These are the palatal petechiae that we will see when a child has a strep infection, the swollen glands, and sometimes later things like we see with Jones criteria in rheumatic fever, the, the damaged nail bed vasculature. So how do we treat it? We think this child has it, what do we do? It is always a three-pronged approach. We need to treat the symptoms. If the child's not sleeping, we need to get them sleeping. If they're looping thoughts or anxious or ticking, we need to treat that. In our functional medicine practice, we use a lot of herbals and nutraceuticals, supplements. Um, in an allopathic practice, you may find that they use a lot more psychoactive medications, and we will talk about both. We remove the source of inflammation. That means treating with antimicrobials. We often will start with an antibiotic because it's been well-researched and it will work faster. We will then often move the children to antimicrobials, herbals um, for the long-term. And we also have to treat the immune disturbances. There has to be immune modulatory anti-inflammatory interventions. The, the big one is IVIG, but there are a lot of things we can use before that. So the first is step in this treatment is establishing the correct diagnosis. And I know a lot of parents want this to be the diagnosis because they, they want this, you know, thinking that there's a treatment for it as opposed to just OCD or autism or whatever. Um, but we need to be clear as practitioners about the diagnosis, because otherwise we're not going to get all of our pediatricians, family practitioners, neurologists, psychiatrists to believe in it unless we establish the correct diagnosis. Then we provide symptomatic relief, treating the symptoms with the most distress first. We treat the infections therapeutically and then preventatively because a lot of kids will get better after the first one, but then the second one or third one are much, much worse. So we need to prevent that second or third from coming. We need to treat the neuroinflammation and the autoimmune infection with immune modulatory interventions. And then we need to remember that this is a relapsing and remitting course, that we need to be prepared for the next virus, the next tooth that's being lost, the next strep infection. This particular article from 2019 really just talks about that the earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome. So these symptoms, what are they? Well, OCD, tics, anxiety, aggression, irritability, sleep disturbances, ADHD, eating disorders, and a lot of the treatments of these overlap. So you'll see me talk about one in one area, but it may be something that we're talking about for ticks, but could also use for anxiety or aggression and irritability. So with OCD, um, if as an allopathic physician, um, a physician is going to start with SSRIs, I always start with a very, very, very low dose. If a typical dose is 20 milligrams, we may start with two milligrams. Um, but we often start with other things. And one of our favorites for OCD is NAC and acetylcysteine. There are more than 17 studies of the treatment of OCD with N acetylcysteine in hair pulling, gambling, nail biting, skin picking, all different types of disorders. 
Um, it is easily oxidized when exposed to air. So I will hear when people buy a bottle of NAC, you know, it really worked the first few days and then it didn't seem to work as well. That may just be because it's oxidized. So when you get a bottle of NAC, take each day's dose and put it in a little blister packed, uh, you know, like um, uh, baggy. Um, or you can get one of the forms that is effervescent tablets, it, tablets in an individual blister pack pill. The only problem with that particular form is there's a lot of sugars in it. And in our kids that have gut dysbiosis, that may not be as good. But individually pack each daily dose and then just open each day um, as you need it. What else do we consider? Well, we consider herbal adaptogens. These are things that help to decrease the adrenal stress response. Ashwagandha is known as the herbal valium, and it's been comparable to, to fluoxetine in animal models. Inositol also decreases OCD. Now, the biggest problem with inositol is getting to the highest dose. And the, the powder that is most helpful is now on back order for we don't know how long. Um, but that was getting to the full dose was five teaspoons of that powder. Now, inositol is a great sweetener. So it's very sweet and tastes good to a lot of our kids. But that one is also good for OCD. I'm a big believer in cannabidiols, um, CBD or hemp oil. That also has been shown in mouse models to decrease their OCD, which is a marble bearing. Passion flower is a lovely herbal. Uh, Dr. Greenblatt wrote a lot on lithium orotate, not lithium the medication, but lithium orotate um, in very low doses, crosses the blood-brain barrier and can decrease OCD. GABA also is very important in modulating glutamates and together with theanine, which help it cross the blood-brain barrier may be very helpful in decreasing OCD. Our children, even the youngest ones, can do mindfulness and mantras, singing Let It Go rather than, from Frozen rather than the, the looping thoughts in their heads, exercise. Um, and I'm a big believer in diet. You know, a lot of people say I didn't come to you because I heard you were the diet doctor. You know, a diet that is anti-inflammatory, which means is full of good fruits and vegetables, non-carbohydrates, good proteins of all sorts, lots of good oils, and then also treating dysbiosis may help to decrease OCD. So this isn't food. As my friend Stu Friedenfeld says, there's no such thing as junk food. It's either junk, which is this, or it's food. Um, just to show you one little girl who came in with OCD, anxiety, and ADHD, um, her teacher and therapist, I wanna thank Dana Lake for these um, pictures, but her teacher and therapist wanted us to use stimulant medications um, and, and recommended therapy. And they were so happy after two weeks that I had put her on the medication and she was so much better. But what really happened is we just put her on a fail-safe diet, which is a diet free of additives, low in salicylates, amines, flavor enhancers, just basically a good anti-inflammatory diet. And with that, after two weeks, she was better, no medication, no real therapy, just a change in her diet. So eating foods like on this page, fermented foods, nuts and seeds, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, turmeric, uh, avocado, ginger, um, good teas, all of these sorts of things. And I know you're saying my kid will never do that. Just get one. Just, just one, get avocado, a little bit of avocado in a smoothie, add a turmeric tea at night um, with a little bit of milk, um, uh, add more oils to what you're cooking, uh, particularly coconut oil, olive oil, um, and avocado oil. Now for anxiety, you'll see a lot of medications here that are on this list, but also you'll see things like melatonin, which helps to naturally increase um, serotonin. Uh, blood pressure medications like guanfacine and propranolol and clonidine that also may be helpful. But again, if we're gonna use any medication, we will start with very, very low dose um, and only as needed. 
Instead, we'll use a lot of these types of things. Now you'll see things like the GABA, the theanine, some of the B vitamins, the hemp oil, the exercise, the meditation that we talked about for OCD, the ashwagandha. But we also do things for magnesium, for anxiety like magnesium, which can be very calming. And if our children are constipated, it's very important for that. Um, high doses of essential fatty acids, those good oils may help anxiety, especially if a child has an MTHFR, especially the C677 allele mutation or cerebral folate deficiency and a positive frat test using methylfolate will be very helpful. Um, ashwagandha, lemon balm, motherwort, passion flower, mimosa bark, all can be very good herbs to treat anxiety. And how about ticks? Others, as we listed for anxiety, again, uh, that's adaptogen, sorry, the P is missing. Um, but magnesium, an insufficiency, the children may have pains, they may have constipation, they may have heightened sensitivities. Um, if they're constipated, a form of citrate or oxide is very good. If they're not, maybe a glycinate or threonate. If they have trouble taking magnesium because the taste isn't great, then do Epsom salt baths. Um, a quarter of a cup to a full cup together with baking soda to alkalinize them may be very helpful. These are some of the medications that are used um, for anxiety, but also for decreasing ticks. Neuroleptics that we use in autism may be helpful in very low doses. And anticonvulsants, second and third generations like um, Keppra and Lamictal in low dosages um, may be very helpful in decreasing uh, ticks. And then again, movement disorder medication, sometimes SSRIs may be helpful. The other thing that's very helpful is therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy for kids with PANS and PANDAS and for parents who have children with PANS and PANDAS is really helpful. A lot of people will say to me, well, my kid can't do that right now. That is true. Some kids are too sick and too severe, but if you as a parent do a session with a trained cognitive behavioral therapist, they will help you to, to learn how to not feed the beast how to help your child help themselves get through this. The other things we do a lot are counter ticks. Those are things like drumming or humming or spinning a widget that help them not to tick. Acupuncture and physical medicine can be very helpful. Meditation and mindfulness, and again, diet and exercise. This is a, a fairly recent study on the rapid eye movement, the REM sleep abnormalities in kids with, with PANS. So sleep disturbances are also something we need to treat. We, we often will start with melatonin, um, but we will use things like GABA, magnesium, 5-HTP, theanine. I'm not a homeopath. I have had some homeopathic training, but the naturopaths in our office are very well trained and uh, use this um, as needed in our kids with PANS and PANDAS. And then certainly all of these herbals can be very um, calming and help with sleep. I will often add a couple of drops of lavender oil, for example, or chamomile oil into a bath to help calm a child down. One thing to keep in mind, if your child is on SSRIs or SNRIs, you do not want to use 5-HTP. It can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome. Um, uh, and you don't want to use it in those cases. Food restrictions, a lot of our children are deficient in zinc. And if you're going to measure zinc, you want to get a red blood cell zinc, an RBC zinc, or at least a plasma zinc. A serum zinc, may, that's what's outside the cell. That may actually be high um, and the zinc inside the cell be low. So you really want to see what's inside the cell, and that is often low, at least uh, 60 to 70 percent of the children in our practice. You want to increase protein in the diet as much as possible using protein powders, liver extract, increase oils. In addition to the ones I mentioned, medium chain triglyceride oil can be very good for kids that are restricted in their eating, and bitters can be helpful. I'm a big fan of digestive bitters, particularly ginger. 
So we usually start when a child comes in and we've established the diagnosis. It's an abrupt onset of OCD or eating restrictions with two of those other things, at least usually three or four others. We'll start with an antibiotic. If the child has significant gut dysbiosis and we really don't feel they're absorbing or, or digesting things well, we may start with an intramuscular form of bicillin, of penicillin. It hurts, um, it is a thick white liquid, but it can be very helpful very quickly. Um, the antibiotics that are usually used are, are penicillin or amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulanate, azithromycin, clarithromycin, cephalexin, cefadroxyl, clindamycin. We will often start with azithromycin because we do see a lot of mycoplasma in this area, azithromycin, and clavulanate both have immune modulatory um, effects. So they're anti-inflammatory as well as antimicrobial. If you were gonna use azithromycin for a prolonged period of time, a child should have an EKG. There have been reports in the adult literature of prolonging the QT interval. In hundreds and hundreds of EKGs, we've had one child with a prolonged QT. So it's a little bit medical legal, but it is something we should do. Um, there is regional resistance. So you should know in your area whether strep, for example, is resistant to azithromycin, and then it should not be used. Um, there are a lot of good studies on ceftonir. That is another we will sometimes use with improvements in ticks and OCD. And then um, we will move on to some of the other antibiotics if those are not helpful. Once a child does improve though, we need to move to prophylactic dosing. If you're gonna use penicillin prophylactically, it's still twice a day. And if you miss one dose, you're not protected for three days. Azithromycin may need to be daily, but we try to get it down to once or twice a week. And then we will also try to remove it entirely and use herbal antimicrobials because the gut is, is really just a, a, a microbiome uh, a plethora of different germs. And if we use antibiotics for too long without effective probiotics, we will deplete the, the ecosystem of our child's microbiome. We feel very comfortable with using antibiotics as long as we're using probiotics, but together with the parents, we may decide to move on to herbals um, if the child is better. Herbals that we do use are Eusnea. Tega is one of my favorites, a little bit hard to find. It's from the Siberian forest. It's a pine needle extract with antifungal, antiviral, and antibacterial activity. Berberine in the form of golden seal is very effective against strep. Neem also, and oregano, which is also very effective against uh, fungus. Um, we will also use some of these other herbs in conjunction. Cordyceps is a wonderful mushroom uh, that can be very helpful in Lyme. Uh, garlic is very effective um, as an adjunct in a lot of our kids. Mycoplasma, I show these pictures not to scare you because I've seen this once in my career with mycoplasma, but to remind me that often mycoplasma in our kids is asymptomatic. And we'll hear grandpa has a mycoplasma pneumonia and the child has a behavioral change and we'll look for mycoplasma and find it. Mycoplasma is very hard to treat herbally. There are several combination products that we use. We also have had recent success with Izatis, some success with Hatunia, colloidal silver, golden seal, but here's where we often need to use antibiotics, um, macrolides like azithromycin or clarithromycin, tetracyclines like minocycline or doxycycline before moving on to herbals. And then viruses, um, not just COVID, but any virus, influenza virus, enteroviruses can cause a PANS uh, illness. And so we look for that history also. We use a lot of antioxidants. Many of our children, up to 80% will be deficient in vitamin D. About 30% will be deficient in vitamin A. Some will also need vitamin C. 
Lysine is a great amino acid. Uh, Monolaurin is a lovely um, uh, product for that interferes with viral assembly and viral maturation. There's a product now that also includes a biofilm buster and is in a, a, a gel um, that can be added easily to a smoothie or to some syrup um, and can be very effective antiviral and anti-Lyme. Zinc, not only for immune system, for eating, but it also inhibits viral replication. And elderberry um, is one that we often use preventatively that stops a virus's capability of, of replicating and penetrating the cell wall. Licorice is a great anti-inflammatory. Ginger increases antioxidant levels um, uh, that can be very helpful. Olive leaf is a lovely herb uh, for preventing viral shedding and assembly of the cell membranes. Lemon balm, which is also very calming, inhibits viral replication. And you guys all know echinacea. We use that in a lot of antiviral um, over-the-counter products. One of the things that's very important in our children with PANS and PANDAS, let's say they started out with PANDAS and then they get um, better from that after an antibiotic and anti-inflammatory protocols and they get exposed to a virus. We immediately implement an acute viral protocol at the onset of a viral illness in the child or any close on contacts, which includes higher doses of vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, lysine, maybe um, some enzymes for defense, um, and, and maybe some other antivirals. Um, Adenotonsillectomy, I get a lot of questions about this. If a child has sleep apnea or frequent group A strep and they need a tonsillectomy for that reason, they should get it. But it's a 50-50 proposition um, in a, a lot of children. Some children get worse after adenotonsillectomy. So you need a trusted ENT to really look at the tonsils and adenoids and decide if that's necessary in your child. As I mentioned, we use a lot of vitamin D. There's no substitute for ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is a great anti-inflammatory. And if your child is in a flare, 10 milligrams per kilogram to help decrease the severity, the duration, or the intensity of that flare may be necessary. We then move on to other anti-inflammatories, which I'll show you in a minute, but some of our kids need more chronic ibuprofen. I talked a little bit of alkalin about alkalinization. When our kids are under stress, they're, they're acidic, they're rusty alkalinizing them, and that's what vegetables do, that's what good fiber does, that's what baking soda in the bath does, tri salts can be very helpful. Xylitol is a sweetener because it also has antimicrobial properties, and both Bliss K12, which is uh, Salivaris K12, it's an oral probiotic, and xylitol in a nasal spray, either in the nose or in the mouth, can be very helpful in our kids who are teething, who have braces or other apparatus, you know, the, the gut starts in the nose and mouth. So we have to keep those clean. This is a, a, a study of vitamin D and decreasing OCD. And this is a study of that strep salivaris. I am not one of those doctors that believe all probiotics with strep are bad. That is not true. Only about 10% of our kids are negatively affected by strep um, species in their probiotics, and they do not cause pandas. Strep salivaris, as in Bliss K12 and products like that, can help to prevent strep and viral pharyngotonsillitis. And now the immune modulators. Probiotics and prebiotics, as I was just talking about, one of my favorite prebiotics is Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a natural yeast against yeast, and it helps to increase secretory IgA, which is the first line of defense in the gut. Aloe is a wonderful anti-inflammatory that can also be helpful in constipation. Um, remember, aloe should be certified. If it tastes good, if it tastes like water, it probably is water and not aloe because aloe doesn't taste great. Essential fatty acids, your omegas, both your threes and a little bit of your sixes with GLA or um, evening primrose oil. The biggest mistake we make with fish oils is not giving enough. 
One of my friends, Joe Maroon, who did the impact test for concussions, um, wrote a book called Fish Oil, and he will use 10 to 18 grams in adults. As long as it's pure fish oil and a good product, you can continue to increase it as tolerated until there's oil in the stool or until, um, unless there's easy bruisability or nosebleeds. That's a, a negative side effect, certainly. Curcumin is one of my favorite anti-inflammatories. There's a lovely product um, that's just curcumin in a very good form um, that, that helps to, to treat anxiety and depression um, as well as support um, uh, and treat inflammation. Flavonoids, particularly quercetin, um, but combination products with quercetin, luteolin, and rutin are mast cell stabilizers. Not all of our children with PANS and PANDAS have mast cell mediated disease, but in those children that do, we need to provide um, mast cell mediators and quercetin is a very good one, as are other antihistamines. Bigger ticket items, so to speak, um, steroids, I can probably count on two hands the number of children I've used steroids in. We, it's a temporary fix. Often, if they're doing very badly, we will use it in the short term. There can be transient worsening, especially in those children with dysbiosis or yeast overgrowth. Um, but if they get better, it, it means that this is indeed, these symptoms are indeed um, related to inflammation. Um, and moving on to further anti-inflammatory immune modulating therapy may well be helpful. Hellman therapy is something I talk about in other talks. These are grain beetle worm eggs that induce immune tolerance. Um, and you can look that up at that particular website if it's something you're interested in. I'm not gonna go in detail in it because I wanna leave time for all of your questions. IVIG, um, certainly there have been a lot of studies. We used to say one and done, and now it really is a, a six cycle course in moderate to severe children. Um, uh, and this is intravenous gamma globulin in high dose. For immunodeficiency, we use low dose, 400 to 600 milligrams per kilogram. With PANS and PANDAS and other autoimmune diseases, you need to use 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram. Um, and, and that's an important distinction. Plasmapheresis or plasma uh, transfer exchange is used in severe disease um, uh, and as is rituximab or monoclonal antibodies, especially in, in children with um, deteriorating and extreme disease and those with eating disorders because of, of PANS or PANDAS. You can do this. I know it seems like a lot, but um, this little boy, you can see some of his prescriptions and the rest are, are nutraceuticals. Um, is smiling because, you know, a few months before this, um, he was rolled up in a ball on the floor, so anxious and with such OCD, he couldn't get to school and couldn't get out of the, the living room. So he is loving his supplements. So for us, it's an initial course of antibiotics, maybe antimicrobials, at least 30 days. It's immune therapy diet, probiotics, prebiotics, anti-inflammatory, steroids, and recalcitrant traces. We will then move on to Hellman therapy in those kids that aren't getting better and either can't get IVIG approved or, or can't do it. Um, uh, plasmapheresis in severe cases and monoclonal antibodies, as I said. We use a lot of nutraceuticals as appropriate, antioxidants if their levels are low, glutathione and NAC support. I'm a big believer in therapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, and then prophylaxis. I have had many kids that get better, and then because they're better, the parents don't want to continue the antibiotic or antimicrobial. And a year later or two years later, they get another infection and they are still prone to this. If the child gets this disease pre-pubertally, they, they may well grow out of it by the time they reach puberty or get through puberty. Those who get it around puberty may need prophylaxis until age 21. That's when the blood-brain barrier re really closes between ages 21 and 25. 
That's why this is a pediatric disease. Can adults present with it? Yes, but usually if that's the case, you can go back and see the abrupt onset in childhood, and this is the second or third, and it was never effectively treated. So it's all about putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And um, it's a clinical diagnosis, not a lab diagnosis. It can be confirmed or not. If a child has an abrupt onset of symptoms and all the test results are negative, that doesn't mean that this isn't PANS or PANDAS. Um, and a complete medical psychiatric history and physical exam are, are really important to rule out all the other uh, diseases. We do strep and mycoplasma titers. We do immune markers. In addition to the ones I mentioned before, we'll do thyroid antibodies, uh, TPO and thyroglobulin. We'll do immunoglobulins, including IgG and IgA subclasses to look for immunodeficiency. And we'll do strep pneumococcal serotypes because that can be a subtle sign of immunodeficiency. Um, there are, you can easily test 14 up to 23 strep pneumococcal serotypes. This is not group A strep that we talk about with pandas. It's another type of, of pneumococcus, what's in the Prevnar vaccine. And most children will have developed immunity to at least seven or eight of these. And so if their immunity is less than that, that may be a subtle sign of immunodeficiency. A urine organic acid test gives us a window into 45 different metabolic pathways, including metabolites of yeast and clostridia, um, mitochondrial function, the energy function of our bodies, the function of some B vitamins we cannot measure accurately in, in regular blood work, and glutathione. We'll also sometimes look at a histine or homocysteine um, level to, to look at glutathione. Neuropsych testing is necessary and warranted and able in an individual child and other testing depending on the presentation and what may be necessary. But for me, we use our treatment as the diagnostic tool. Um, the antimicrobials, the immunotherapy, the diet, the emotional and nutraceutical supports. So get a culture. Negative cultures aren't the gospel. There can be false negatives and um, uh, the child may present with behavioral symptoms without any culture proven strep or other viruses or, or bacteria. So check family members. Look at the anus. Um, uh, ASO titers rise one to six weeks after an infection. So negative titers can be seen in many children, up to 40%. So there can either be a group A strep culture that's positive, palatal petechiae, a scarlatiniform rash, that's a fine red rash, or intimate exposure, meaning a sibling that is group A strep, together with the, the, the behavioral and uh, sensory and motor abnormalities, OCD and those other things we were talking about. So all of these are the faces of pandas, a child with an abrupt onset of an eating disorder, a child that's not sleeping at night, a child with a new onset of separation anxiety, with, with abrupt onset of ADD or OCD or raging or handwriting deterioration. It's a spectrum, but kids can get better. Not all the children will have all the symptoms, um, but, but many will have many. It needs a, a comprehensive treatment plan that includes the antimicrobials, the immunotherapy and the therapy. Um, uh, and it's important to not blame the child and to allow fluid access in and out of services, in and out of gym, getting um, accommodations for testing and homework, late slips on file. Um, and with any abrupt onset of symptoms, tics, OCD, anxiety, regression, and particularly those somatic symptoms, urinary or sleep changes, think about PANS or PANDAS. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pull up some of the questions you guys had. 
Um, Gabriella, do you want me just to go through them or do you want me to, uh, do you want to ask me some? How do you want to do it? Um, any way you want. Um, I, I have them in front of me. Uh, so, do I. so if your kid is in an active flare, what are your sort of go-to um, remedies and courses of action to take? So the, the first thing is giving the ibuprofen 10 milligrams per kilogram to try to get them out of the flare. The second thing is to try to figure out what's causing the flare. So is there a recent strep infection? Then get them back on an antibiotic or an antimicrobial. Is there anybody in the family that's sick with a virus? Then do the acute um, viral protocol. Um, uh, is the child teething? Did they just have braces placed? Again, there's not much for that, although there are some things that you used on your kids when they were babies for teething that may well work now, but ibuprofen is the best thing there. Um, and then treating uh, uh, the symptoms um, when they're in a flare, you know, and again, my go-tos are, are CBD, um, uh, curcumin, um, uh, essential fatty acids, all those anti-inflammatories, and then things that help to cut the anxiety in the OCD. Again, CBD, GABA, NAC, um, those sort of things. Um, if you could pick one thing, <laughs> and we know that's a treatment triangle, so it's hard to pick one thing. So um, what would you pick? Supplement, food, lifestyle? Um, that, that's a tough one. I, you know, I, I, I and I want to say that, that, um, you know, I would pick one thing and I think if it's strep, the first thing I would put a kid on is azithromycin. But if you're going to be feeding the child junk, it's going to be a lot harder to get better. So I would um, fix constipation, try to fix the gut, and then get something started that has an anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. And that's why I say azithromycin. And then the ibuprofen too. So can long-term inflammation cause permanent damage? Um, long-term inflammation uh, is something we try to prevent. Um, we don't know for sure if that damage is permanent. I can tell you we have lots of kids we have treated that are now adults and they're absolutely fine. Um, and so I never want to think that it's that it is permanent. Um, but that's why treating the inflammation is so important um, early on and on an ongoing basis, both through lifestyle changes, diet, et cetera. And I should mention, Gabriella, uh, when I was talking about those other things to look for, I thought about, but then didn't say mold and Lyme. You know, in this area of the country, we really do. And I know Dr. Wells is talking about that in a few weeks, but we really do need to look for uh, Bartonella, Babesia, Borrelia, and, and Lyme. And we also need to look for mold. Um, because I have had many children who initially had pandas who got better and then got exposed to wa water damaged buildings and got much, much worse. So I just wanted to mention those two also. So for mold, is it exacerbating the issue or is it a trigger or both? Um, in my opinion, it can be a trigger of pans, um, but it is certainly an exacerbator. Um, most mold disease uh, under Richie Shoemaker, Neil Nathan's diagnosis is not of abrupt onset. So if it's of abrupt onset, it will fit into pans. If it's a more subacute onset, then it's still an inflammatory response and we still need to treat it with things like glutathione, NAC, binders to bind the mycotoxins and getting out of the environment or remediating the environment. Um, but it, if it's a subacute onset, it may not be um, a trigger, but an exacerbator. All right. One more mold question, which wasn't on the list, but I'm going to ask it. Okay. So say you are living in mold, but you can't remediate quite yet and you can't move quite yet, um, either one. Is it worth treating? Yes. And the reason it's worth treating is, um, you know, I've had a lot of patients in the Far East, in Hong Kong, 
Um, and many of them are in apartment buildings that are incredibly moldy and they can't move and they can't remediate and they can't do anything about it. If you bind the mycotoxins, if you treat with high dose essential fatty acids, binders, uh, dietary changes, um, antifungal and antimicrobial nasal sprays and herbals, you can get the kids better even if they're still in that environment. So yes, treat even if you can't remediate or get out. Okay. And then um, there was a whole group of questions about getting doctors on board. So I'm going to try to um, put them together into sort of one um, if I can. Basically, like, how do you get started? And say you get started with your typical pediat your day to day pediatrician, and they tell you something like right. they don't believe in it. What do you do? Right. Um, it's a great question. And it's really why I wrote this guidebook because, um, and the flow chart you see behind me um, is a trademark flow chart of how to navigate through this through a physician. So we're, we've developed a membership program um, and a mentorship program that can include little videos that they can watch for two to three minutes that can include little snippets of case studies. So um, not to, to promote any of this, but I would say that, that taking this book when it's out this summer to your pediatrician um, letting them know that this is out there. There are hundreds and hundreds of references. That's really important. If your pediatrician or family practitioner will not um, believe in it, go to the, the Aspire um, website and look for the practitioners, naturopaths, um, physicians, um, chiropractors, nutritionists, dietitians who are familiar and who can help you start navigating this disease and, and getting treatment for your child. And then um, say your child has had symptoms for many, many years. Um, what do you do then? Like, how do you get your doctor to help you parse out what happened in the past and be a good detective? Right. Um, you know, we have probably 30 pages of questionnaires that, that we have people go through, plus our two to three hour initial, because we're trying to get back to, you know, if this has been going on for five years, well, where was the start? And getting back to, was there an abrupt onset and what was going on at that time? Um, we've had little girls like Sydney who started with ticks at age three, and the abrupt onset was with a strep infection, but it was never noticed because it was really mild and they went away and then they got ticks again after viruses and then they got ticks again after braces. And so you want to go back and look at your own history and put together a good medical history for a physician of, of when things came up. Was it seasonal? Was it after somebody else in the family was sick? And really look at that. Then the, the second thing is, you may not see anything at that point in time with treating strep or mycoplasma or whatever, but you may well see something with immune modulating therapies. And that's where I'll try all of the immune modulatory therapies um, if we haven't gotten anywhere with antibiotics or antimicrobials. Okay. Um, you spoke a little bit about COVID triggering symptoms. Can you talk about that a little? Are all, do all, not every is everybody who getting neuropsychiatric symptoms after COVID pans or not? No, no. Again, um, COVID is another virus that that may cause misdirected immune response and molecular mimicry. And uh, a percentage we don't know the exact percentage yet, but probably very similar to other viruses that we see. It is that you will get a neuroinflammatory response. We saw a lot more after Omicron, and that may well have more to do with the numbers, meaning there were more children getting COVID, um, uh, even though it was mild uh, illness, and then six weeks later presenting with neuropsychiatric symptoms. Again, with COVID, like all viruses, we use an acute viral protocol. We use antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin D, um, essential fatty acids, lysine, 
uh, Mana Lauren and, and brands of that, um, olive leaf extract um, and medications for viruses that, that may be warranted um, to help decrease the viral load as well as treat the, the inflammation and the symptoms. Okay. Um, do you see children with PANS also have seizures and epilepsy? Um, I think that, that like with autism, um, PANS and PANDAS are overlapping Venn diagrams. Not all children with autism have PANS or PANDAS. Definitely not all children with PANS or PANDAS have seizures, but there are a group that can have seizures. Um, uh, but um, it's not that all children do or seizures either increase the severity or increase the likelihood. Um, you spoke a little bit about mast cell. Did you say what percentage or do you have a rough idea of how many kids are dealing with both? Well, mast cell mediated disease is much more rare than the chat rooms and Google stuff will lead us to believe. True mast cell mediated disease usually involves um, hives or other rashes of an abrupt onset after exposure to something. Now, many, many, many children have inflammation, but it may or may not be related to mast cell activation. Some of the things that work for mast cell mediated disease also work for the inflammation we see with pans and pandas. Antihistamines, um, uh, antihistamines together with other anti-inflammatories, medications, um, not just steroids, but things like ketotifen and um, chromalin sodium um, and uh, uh, quercetin, as I mentioned, and other flavonoids. Um, so it, it's, it's not a large percentage, again, an overlapping circle, but again, a lot of the treatments for mast cell mediated diseases work um, for the inflammation we see with other autoimmune diseases like PANS and PANDAS. Okay. Um... So you talked a little bit about SSRIs. Why is low and slow the way to go? And how do you sort of judge when one could go raise that dose? Um, so again, we usually start with nutraceuticals. We will start, for example, with 5-HTP, or we will start with hemp oil or um, magnesium or um, many different agents such as that. If we move on to an SSRI, we find that very low doses often will be enough. So we don't have to move up, but we slowly at a week or two weeks at a time will increase the dosage to a point together with a psychiatrist or, or their, their primary care physician to a point where we're seeing enough benefit or not. Um, if we get to a full dose and there's no benefit, then we wean off of that. But again, we will try many other modalities before we'll get to SSRIs um, in our practice. A couple of people have asked in the chat questions box, and I had that question too, so I'm gonna ask. Um, okay. what was the, do you happen to know the study that talked about the difference between the executive functioning in PANS versus, um, was it, what was Tourette. it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it, I can't draw the study up without going back to my notes um, right at this very moment. Um, but the, the ideas are that they're looking for those math visuospatial skill defects, the geometry, the, the um, uh, copying figure defects, the anxiety together with um, uh, the tics or the OCD, looking at all of those symptoms. Um, you don't have to have a neuropsychologist that is trained in PANS and PANDAS to do the neuropsychiatric testing, but you will see differences in those children um, that just have tics um, and their neuropsych testing as opposed to those who have PANS and PANDAS have another math visuospatial um, margin drift, all of those things I mentioned there. Um, 
because you talked about the PANS and autism, um, I just want to make a note that Dr. O'Hara and a couple other doctors on our professional advisor board wrote a toolkit about handling PANS and autism. But if you could just do a really brief, like, do all kids with PANS have autism? No. And how do you make a determination? Again, same way as you do with any other child. Um, if a child has autism, they may well have OCD and perseverations and anxiety and sensory issues and sleep issues all along of a very chronic or subacute nature. But if then they have an abrupt change, an abrupt worsening, a dramatic onset of tics or abrupt change in OCD, then that is a child that I will look at in addition to having autism, to having pans or pandas, and I'll do the detective work in that child just like I would any other. But it's not just having OCD and autism that makes you fit into the pans, pandas criteria. Okay. Um, in your practice, do you think your the children sort of have an idea of when symptoms of pans may be coming on or not? Do you think they learn that or... Is it sort of all over the map? It's all over the map. Some do, um, and some know uh, that they, they get a feeling on the inside before it gets worse, and they can talk to you about it. It is something that I believe cognitive behavioral therapy helps with, figuring out what are the ABCs, what's the antecedent, what's the stressor, and then what's the behavior. You know, children can learn when their heart rate goes up or when they get sweaty or when their vein their their brain seems to vibrate or when they get that 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 sort of jumpy feeling um and then what's the consequence well what you want to do with the abcs is when you get the antecedent try to change that behavior so giving them tools to be able to take a fast acting antihistamine or or flavonoid or be able to do a mindfulness or meditation or go out and exercise or whatever it may be. Um, and then a little bit about POTS. So we have pans and POTS. Um, do you see a lot of patients with POTS and, and why do patients tend or could tend to also develop, go on to develop POTS and other things, but particularly? Right. Um, I call it pots and pans. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, because we have such a long waiting list, we often see children after they have had this disease for many, many months or many, many years. And if your body and your adrenals, your fight or flight are under stress um, for that long a period of time, you can develop dysautonomia, which is dysregulation of the autonomic or automatic nervous system. So POT stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And that's just about the heart rate and blood pressure uh, variability. Like you stand up and you feel like you're going to faint, but it can be many, many more symptoms than that. It can be um, uh, fatigue, it can be um, nausea, it can be sweating, it can be um, brain fog. Um, and our children sort of need the high octane of the fuel. So they need more water, at least an ounce per kilo per day. They need more salt um, if they have POTS. They may need B12. That's one of the natural interventions that may be very helpful for POTS. Um, they may need moderate isotonic or isometric exercise. They may need compression socks or abdominal binders. Um, there are a lot of techniques that can be used before you get to um, uh, medications uh, for POTS that can be very, very helpful. But it's also treating the underlying PANS or other autoimmune disease. More than 50% of cases of POTS are associated with some autoimmune disease. Um, just quickly going back to the allergies and mast cell, not full on dis disorders, but for this lovely spring season that we've embarked on in those trees that are the absolute worst, um, my mortal enemies, 
Can you give an example of what antihistamines you would use yep. that aren't just the course, you know, the mast cell stabilizers? Right. So, I mean, you can get over the counter, um, you know, brands like Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, um, uh, over the counter also nasochrome, which is a chromalin sodium that is a nasal spray. There's a lovely uh, uh, prescription form called gastrochrome, uh, which is an oral form uh, of chromalin sodium. Um, I uh, particularly like a product in allergy season called All Clear, um, which is from Integrative Therapeutics. Um, it's a combination um, product that's very helpful for allergies. Um, quercetin, as I mentioned, uh, there are combination products like Theotheoretes NeuroProtect. That's a combination of quercetin, luteolin, and rutin that can be um, very helpful. Uh, and um, there are products like dehist, histes that have antihistamines that are natural anti-inflammatories also. So any and all of those that work for allergies um, to help to decrease the symptoms. In your practice, do you find more kids react negatively to Zyrtec than others? Because there's always talk about that. Yeah, I I have not found that. I actually find that that we have more negative reactions to Claritin in our practice. So I think it's very individualized. And certainly if a child has a negative reaction, get rid of it and try a different one. Okay. Um, you mentioned binders with the molds. How yep. long can kids stay on a binder? As long as they're not constipated years. Um, you know, I, it, uh, a, a binder that has charcoal in it needs to be at least two hours away from any other supplements or medications, or it'll bind to that and pull it out of the system. Uh, cholesteramine, well coal, which are prescription binders used for mold disease, need to be four hours away. But as long as they're away from any other supplements and the, or medications and the child is not constipated, they're very safe for a prolonged period of time. Okay, and then two more questions. Um, they keep piling in and at a certain point we have to be done. Um, we know that sleep disturbances are a major symptom of pants pan as part of the diagnostic criteria, but what, can we talk about fatigue? Yep. Do you see that a lot? And how does that all work with everything? Right. So I mentioned that you'll sometimes see the fatigue with kids that have POTS. You'll also see the fatigue with kids that have Lyme or mold. Sometimes you'll see the fatigue because they're not sleeping. Um, I always do a detailed sleep history and make sure that they're getting good REM sleep because if they have that REM disinhibition, they're never getting to good restorative sleep. So we'll work on the sleep first. Um, and then they may have fatigue because they're ticking or they're having looping thoughts all the time or they're having anxiety. And the fatigue is because their body is so stressed by doing the, all those other things. So the treatments for fatigue, first treating the, the sleep, second, um, uh, uh, trying to add something, trying to check the mitochondria, the energy system of the body. Does this child have mitochondrial dysfunction, which can be secondary to the infections? And we need to treat that. Do they have a low carnitine level? Do they um, have a need for CoQ10, for example? And if that's not the case, we'll look at that urine organic acid and see if they're deficient in certain B vitamins, because sometimes a B complex or B12, as I mentioned, may be very helpful. And there are medications and, uh, well, some stimulant medications and some not stimulant medications that are used for kids with tremendous fatigue or brain fog to help get them started in the day. And if all else fails, we'll first use herbals and supplements, um, things like uh, lion's mane and bacopa, um, eccentrate, and then we may move on to medications in, in the kids with severe um, attention issues, brain fog, or fatigue. And so those kids that have severe t fatigue that last a long time, do they, um, do they get diagnosed with chronic fatigue or is it just? They may. They may, but we are always digging because a lot of those kids have chronic Lyme mm -hmm. or chronic mold disease, and that's been missed. So we will look for those two and treat those. And usually their, their fatigue gets better if we find them and, and treat it appropriately. Right. 
And then the final question is really about um, what happens between those flares where, the, where, where we've had the acute onset, we treat, and then we have that gradual um, remittance of symptoms. So what are the symptoms that you see in your practice that sort of linger the longest? Is it the OCD? Is it how long do things tend to resolve? Like handwriting changes or margin drift? Do though, what kind of things do you often see sort of just really pull together with treatment, with the medical treatment and what other symptoms may need a lot more of the therapeutic, not just the ERP and the CBT, but maybe something else? One of the things that, that really can last is the looping thoughts um, because kids don't often talk about it um, doctors and parents don't often get into it and look at it, look for it. And so that's, that's there in the background for quite a long period of time. Also the, the handwriting and, and, um, brain fog kind of things may take longer to get better. Usually the anxiety, we can get better fairly quickly, um, uh, but it's very individualized from child to child. And I think part of it is they come in so anxious and we start working on that and that gets better and they haven't told us about the looping thoughts. And so we're not really focusing on that or treating that early on. Right. So. And I'll just say that is one of the reasons when you mentioned this, why the parents participating in that therapy with the parent management technique can really help because there's a lot of times, and I know I'm absolutely guilty of this, of um, and guilty in the fact that there's no blame because we're just learning as we go along, um, is that sometimes we don't actually realize what those looping thoughts are because they're not in their head, so we can't see them, but we also don't know what extent we're accommodating their um, compulsions and we're being brought in. So it can be really, uh, we can help extend that. I know that as somebody who has looping thoughts and has kids with looping thoughts. So <laughs> anyway, um, I know there were other questions and some of a lot of the questions did get looped into all of these. So I hope that most everybody didn't and some people didn't because they were very um, specific to your child or they were about specific doses, which um, no doctor should be answering actually, not just Dr. Hare. And, um, but if you have something really burning and pressing, um, send them to me and maybe I can help someone find an answer for you um, or post it if you're a parent, um, if you're a parent or an adult with dealing with it. Um, you're welcome to join our Aspire Facebook group. And which is right, the link is right on the front page of our website. Um, so it's not that hard to find. I can never remember it off the top of my head. Um, but we have a lot of resources and we're here to help. Like I said, the video will go up sooner than later, God willing. And thank you so much for your time and for everybody that's um, come and stayed for all the questions. And we will see you again. And the schedule for everybody else is coming up and Dr. Lindsay Wells is next May with talking about all things Lyme. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Gabriella. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And Gabriella, you are a gem. Thank you. So is everybody here? <laughs>